Hi, we're starting Unit 4H, The Neurocognitive Disorders. We're in Townsend this time. It's Chapter 22, pages 332 to 364. On lesson objectives, we're going to identify the normal cognitive changes that accompany aging. It's important to note that dementia or neurocognitive disease is not an inevitable part of aging, although some cognitive changes, um, including reaction time, recall time, short-term memory, and um, some differences in the ability to process new information uh, are sort of part of that normal aging process. We want to differentiate between delirium and dementia. Now it's important to note that the term dementia has been replaced in the DSM-5 by the global term neurocognitive disorders. However, because the term dementia is in common um, usage and because it does differentiate from delirium uh, quite a bit, you will hear me refer to those two terms sort of interchangeably, NCD and dementia. Um, but delirium is quite different from dementia. It's got a more abrupt onset. It's got a particular cause that we address. Dementia is progressive, irreversible, and uh, not curable. <clears throat> so it's, we're going to differentiate between those two uh, things and discuss how we address them. We're going to discuss how information gathered dur during the history can identify these problems which sometimes have an insidious onset, um, and so we want to intervene as early as we can to preserve as much function and prolong as much uh, meaningful quality of life as we can. And we want to apply the nursing process to uh, clients with cognitive disorders. We're also going to address some family interventions. Um, so we'll get started. Um, it's also going to be helpful if you want to refer to some of the websites that I talk about. Um, the Alzheimer's Association has a very good one with a lot of uh, very good, clear quality information on these disorders. In the way of an introduction to this unit, uh, your book defines neurocognitive disorders. You can find this definition if you want it on page 332. As a disorder in which a clinically significant deficit in cognition or memory exists, representing a significant change from their baseline. Okay, so that will cover your um, deliriums, which are a more abrupt onset, and your dementias, which are a more uh, insidious or slower onset. Um, the incidence is increasing due to the aging of the population, but by no means is it exclusive of younger people. There are some dementias that will start younger if they're due to traumatic brain injury. There are early onset Alzheimer's patients who have a familial form of uh, Alzheimer's. <clears throat> And we have other types of dementias that can um, happen to younger people as well. And delirium sometimes uh, happens to younger patients. So I have some facts and figures that I pulled off of the Alzheimer's Association website. And these just give you an idea of the scope of the problem of dementia. Uh, they don't really talk about delirium, but um, Alzheimer's is one of the most common uh, causes of dementia. There are other types, but Alzheimer's is the predominant. It can be up to 60 to 80 percent, according to the Alzheimer's Association website. I think your book puts a different number. It um, doesn't matter. It's not something that I would test on. So um, just to give you an idea, it is a very uh, significant cause of disability in America. 5.4 million Americans are living with Alzheimer's. About 200,000 of them are under the age of 65, which can be devastating to families. They might be caregivers themselves. They are usually working. They may have children to support. Um, so that's sort of important to remember. 15 million family members are impacted by caring for Alzheimer's patients. Uh, and they can spend up to 18.1 billion hours of unpaid care every year. And that costs them on average, and it depends on the person, $15,000 in uh, income every year just to reduce workload or to um, even sometimes quit their jobs to take care of someone who suffers from a neurocognitive disorder. Um, the cost for caregivers, I was surprised to find, is not um, usually reimbursable by insurance. It's considered custodial care. It's not considered medical care. And it can be up to ninety dollars or $100,000 a year. It can actually be more than that, depending on the facility. Um, and there is a five-year look-back period. And, you know, I had to find all this out by experience. You can't just, you know, sign over your house to somebody um, and expect to qualify for Medicare or Medicaid um, to get into a long-term care facility or to get a long-term caregiver. There is a five-year look-back period. So, this is a prohibitively expensive um, disease. 
about 40% of caregivers suffer from major depressive disorder. That's a very high percentage of the population living with a major um, emotional illness. 60% of caregivers rate their stress as very high, um, and I don't doubt that at all. By the year 2050, it is believed that one American will be diagnosed with the disease every 33 seconds. Um, the cost for health care is estimated right now at $236 billion a year for people who have dementias, and that is only expected to increase. So those are just some um, introductory facts and uh, statistics that might give you an idea of how big a problem this is in the United States. The first topic we need to discuss under the neurocognitive disorders is delirium, and delirium is defined as a disturbance in the level of awareness and a change in cognition that develops rapidly over a short period. This is an acute crisis. This is not a long-term progressive disorder. This is something that happens quickly as a result of an underlying condition, such as a medical disorder, examples of which include things like a urinary tract infection in your older folks, um, a high fever, um, meningitis sometimes causes that delirium. We can have dehydration or electrolyte imbalances, such as uh, hyponatremia. Um, seizures, people who are post-ictal can have uh, delirium. Um, and these are things that uh, are sort of short-term. Now, symptoms of delirium, you'll see down below, there's a few disorientation to time and place. People don't know who they are, where they are, they're very confused. Sometimes you'll get emotional instability. Um, some people will experience illusions where something looks differently than it should. They hallucinate at times, disorganized thinking, extreme distractibility, no ability to reason or problem solve. Um, you get this rambling, incoherent speech, and it usually does begin very abruptly. Uh, it can sometimes take a few hours or days to develop. Now I'll give you an example. When my father-in-law uh, became ill last March, he was very, very sharp. And when his kidneys started to fail and the nitrogen in his blood and the creatinine started to rise, he started to see an alteration in his mental status. As those levels got even higher, his kidneys uh, were not able to excrete them. Um, you saw even further confusion and disorientation to the point where he was just every once in a while mumbling most of the time, um, very sort of out of it. Um, previous to that, he had no changes in cognition. He had no symptoms of a dementia or a progressive mental condition. This was solely related to um, acute renal failure. Um, and the key to this is that it usually subsides if and when the underlying cause is resolved. Um, now, in that case, that did not happen because he was, you know, at the he was in hospice. Um, however, in people who have, let's say, a urinary tract infection, we're going to address our care at attacking that underlying cause. If they are in alcohol detox, we want, to, um, we want to address that. If they are in DKA, we want to stabilize their blood sugar. Um, if they have a fever, we want to lower the fever. If they're dehydrated, we give them fluids. You get the idea. That's how we handle delirium. So that is how we differentiate the deliriums from the uh, more progressive types of NCD. Now that we've defined delirium, we can differentiate it from dementia, and neurocognitive disorder, mild or major, is the term that replaced both mild cognitive impairment and um, dementia. However, uh, just to differentiate it from delirium, it might be easier to use the term dementia, and you might even see it on a test as the word dementia, um, because delirium is sort of lumped in this category as well. Um, there are two basic types of neurocognitive disorder. There is the primary, where the disorder itself is the major sign of an organic brain disorder that is progressive, um, for example, Alzheimer's disease. And then we have secondary um, dementias or secondary NCD, where the cognitive changes are actually due to another disorder, for example, HIV-related dementia or um, Korsakoff psychosis, Wernicke's encephalopathy, which cause dementias related to alcohol abuse. Just to compare and contrast again, um, delirium from neurocognitive disorder, um, aka dementia. Remember that our uh, delirium was a rapid onset, abrupt, it was like a sudden change in personality. With our dementias, what we have is progressive, um, gradual deterioration of function. Um, months or years, not days. 
With our delirium, we had rapid fluctuation of vital signs that were indicative of the underlying cause. With our dementias, generally speaking, our vital signs are stable. Unless they have some other medical condition that's comorbid with it. Um, also, we have uh, with delirium an altered level of consciousness. With dementia, generally until you get to the very severe stages, um, level of consciousness remains. They're still awake, they're walking around, they're talking, they're, uh, until they get to those later stages, they still um, have a level of alertness, although their orientation may change. Um, also remember that with our delirium, um, it is associated with perceptual changes, hallucinations, illusions. We don't generally have that with um, neurocognitive disorder. So I'm just going to say no hallucinations or illusions. They may have um, some false beliefs. They can get a little bit paranoid, a little bit delusional. Um, especially towards the more moderate to severe uh, stages of dementia. Um, but they don't generally see things that aren't there. They don't hear things that aren't there. Uh, you know, they don't make those perceptual mistakes that you see with delirium. And the biggest one is that delirium is usually reversible if we can, excuse me, address the root cause. Dementia is irreversible and progressive. It gets worse and worse until the person dies from it or from something related. So in terms of assessment, it's really helpful to um, compare and contrast some of the changes that occur with normal aging as opposed to the changes we see in neurocognitive disorder. I'm just going to um, highlight the changes in normal aging. Now, <clears throat> most of your changes in normal aging involve sort of a slowing of response but important intellectual functions are still intact. For example, you see a slight decline in vocabulary after the age of 70. Um, nothing major, they're not forgetting big words um, that they use all the time, but you know they might not have as large a vocabulary. Slight decreases in the ability to process new information or learn. This just means it maybe takes longer to learn foreign language or to learn to get to a new place. Um, Recall time and short-term memory, you see slight declines with those. Um, they might have to use more lists and rehearse a little bit more. But patients who are just, or people who are just aging normally um, still have these important intellectual functions. They can still reason, they can still problem solve. Um, their personality is usually intact. Um, and anything they frequently practice, loading a dishwasher, driving home from a place that they go to frequently, um, typing if they know how to type, all intact. They're not going to forget them suddenly. They're not just going to lose those skills. Um, skills that they don't practice as often might take a little bit longer to recall, but they're still there. Um, and you still have a perspective memory in normal aging, meaning that you still know what you're supposed to do. You might make an appointment and forget that you had an appointment but remember it later, um, but you're not, it's not the kind of thing where you have forgotten it and it's lost completely. So those are changes you see with normal aging. Now, on the other hand, when you have neurocognitive disorder, now you have an impairment in abstract thinking, you have an impairment in judgment. Now, a person who is normally aging, <clears throat> who just has some slight cognitive decline, um, is not going to forget what to do if their house is on fire. They're not going to forget what to do if they find a wallet. Um, they're not going to forget what to do if uh, they see somebody about to cross the street and there's a car coming. Um, a person with neurocognitive disorder might. They might forget what to do if the fire alarm goes off. They might forget what to do um, you know, in a situation that requires a little bit better decision making. These are people who, um, at the milder end of the spectrum, they pick up a phone and um, somebody can scam them out of a great deal of money because they no longer have the judgment um, to keep from giving people their credit card information or you know other information that might be um, used against them. Impulse control is affected in neurocognitive disorder, not affected in normal aging. Um, conventional rules of social conduct can be disregarded in uh, neurocognitive disorder. You don't see that with normal aging. Personal appearance and hygiene are neglected. So when we see people who formerly took great pride in their homes and in their personal appearance, um, we may be looking at somebody with some cognitive uh, impairment. 
language may be impaired, you really don't see that with normal aging. So they can forget words, especially when you get towards the more severe um, stages of neurocognitive disorder. People have what's called uh, apraxia, aphasia, agnosia. Um, they have the inability to recognize objects, the inability to remember um, words that they use frequently. They may not remember faces. They may forget uh, motor skills. And you see personality changes with uh, neurocognitive disorder <clears throat> and a loss of function even in skills that they frequently practice. These are folks who forget how to wash dishes. You know, it was kind of funny. I remember um, somebody saying once that, you know, Alzheimer's isn't when you lose your car keys. Alzheimer's is when you're looking at your car keys and you can't remember what they're for. So that's sort of a big difference with um, neurocognitive impairment um, as opposed to normal aging. So let's talk about some of the different types of dementias. Um, there's Alzheimer's disease. This is your most common, <clears throat> okay? And Alzheimer's disease is responsible for about 60% of all dementias. Your book says 50 to 60. The Alzheimer's Association says uh, 60 to 80. Probably doesn't matter much. It's just the most common type. It is the predominant type of dementia. Um, there are plaques made of beta amyloid that build up in the brain and affect um, transmission of signals and then there are these tangles that are made up of a protein called tau protein and what happens with the tau protein is that it interferes with calcium and magnesium calcium is allowed to enter the brain cell and damage it irreversibly um, and the only reason I want you to kind of take a note of that is that there's a medication that aims to sort of prevent the damage and slow it down there's nothing by the way that cures Alzheimer's disease at this moment um, there are only things that slow it down. We have vascular dementia is the second most common type of dementia. So NCD due to vascular changes. Um, and this is caused by either heart disease or stroke. You have a, an ischemic insult to the brain um, that causes irreversible brain damage. Um, you can have a series of multiple small infarcted areas, little tiny strokes, microscopic areas of damage in the brain. Um, vascular dementia is a little bit different in that Alzheimer's disease will cause a global deficit. You'll see all of the domains of cognition affected by Alzheimer's. Um, whereas vascular dementia, you can see different changes. It's much more variable because it depends on which area of the brain is being attacked. And you can also see sort of lucid periods um, interspersed with periods of profound um, impairment and functioning. It's vascular dementia. We have frontotemporal NCD. This is kind of rare, and it's also called Pick's disease. It causes a lot of um, behavioral and personality changes. There's Lewy body dementia, um, and that's related to Parkinson's disease. Um, people with Lewy body dementia are very sensitive to the effects of neuroleptic medications, so you want to be careful with that. Um, then we have NCD due to traumatic brain injury, um, your boxers. Uh, people who come back from the Middle East, and this is brain damage due to repeated um, insult to the brain. And we have Parkinson's disease dementia. Parkinson's can look very, very, very like um, Alzheimer's at the end. Um, you know, it starts with the motor symptoms and progresses to the dementia. Um, and so people who have Parkinson's disease, dementia, will look very similar to people with Alzheimer's. Korsakoff syndrome you should be familiar with from substance abuse. Um, Korsakoff syndrome is that uh, chronic um, thiamine deficiency um, leads to irreversible brain damage, and these people uh, have profound dementia sometimes. Huntington's disease is a genetic disorder. Um, we talked about it a little bit in genetics. But it starts in the 30s or 40s uh, and progresses until the person has profound uh, motor and cognitive deficits. <clears throat> and then we have prion disease. Prion disease is a little bit more rare, but you still do see it. Um, Creutzfeldt jacob disease is one kind of prion disease. Now, you can have CJD that is um, familial. You can have CJD that is... Um, acquired, meaning that there's an infectious cause. Um, and then you can have CJD or Creutzfeldt Jacob disease that is of unknown origin. Um, so, um, also, mad cow disease uh, falls under that prion disease category. 
But typically what you see is that the course is extremely rapid with progression from diagnosis to death in less than two years. Um, and this used to be a disorder, I kind of remember this from microbiology, that when it's inherited, um, funeral directors used to get it. Um, you can also see it sometimes with certain neurosurgeries and certain transplanted organs, for example, corneal transplants, um, bone transplants. It's rare, but it does happen, and that is another cause of neurocognitive disorder. There are a few other general medical conditions that can cause um, progressive neurocognitive disorder, including um, chronic hypothyroidism. Your book lists a whole bunch of them on page 341, multiple sclerosis, fluid and electrolyte imbalances, um, different vitamin deficiencies, brain tumors, um, but really, you know, those, you're talking about very tiny percentages for each one of those things. You can take a look at them if you want to, but the major ones are all listed. I'd like to talk about the stages of Alzheimer's disease, and I don't need you to memorize which symptoms go with which stage. I do want you to understand that there is a progression. Um, we start with no symptoms, then we have mild symptoms, then they get progressive to moderate, and then they become severe. So you go from a person who functions at a high level to a person who cannot function at all in a course of seven stages. So stage one is no symptoms. Um, there are beta amyloid plaques and tangles, but they are not causing any behavioral changes or loss of memory. Stage two is forgetfulness. And at this point, <clears throat> this isn't your ordinary forgetfulness. You missed a doctor's appointment because you're busy doing a million things, and then you know you get that phone call that reminds you, you go, oh yeah, no, this is I forgot that I ever called my doctor. You might forget names of people that you you know, maybe not close people, but people that you know. Um, it becomes a little bit difficult to get things done. Uh, so this person can get a little obsessive compulsive and have lists, um, apps in their phone that remind them. Um, they might have little sticky notes all over the place. They just are starting to get a little forgetful and it's forgetful beyond your normal, ordinary um, lapses of memory. Stage three is mild cognitive decline, and this is where things become obvious to the person um, and to the people close to them. You have a decline in the ability to uh, do any planning, a little bit of a decline in ability to problem solve. Um, this is the person who can get lost on their way to the grocery store that they've gone to every week. And this is sort of where, what I mean um, when you're talking about normal aging as opposed to neurocognitive disorders. Um, people who have normal changes related to aging don't get lost walking to familiar places or driving to familiar places. They don't forget the names of people they've worked with um, for 15 years. Um, this is a person who um, has difficulty recalling words. Um, and the person starts to notice, and so there's, they start to compensate a little bit. Now in stage four, this is sort of a turning point, this mild to moderate cognitive decline. Um, you go from a person who can function at a relatively high level with some deficits to a person who is becoming increasingly unable to function independently. Um, at this point, they're forgetting major events. Now, for example, my father, um, even though he had more of a vascular dementia than Alzheimer's, a lot of this stuff will still apply. Um, he forgot what 9-11 was, and prior to that, he had been a patriotic American. He was a veteran of the service. Um, and so for him to forget a major event like 9-11, um, well, he had to be told that that's where the towers were hit. And I remember being at his house when that had happened. So there's no way um, that without dementia he would have forgotten that. Um, and that's when it sort of became obvious to us. Um, these are folks who cannot perform basic tasks. For example, um, when my mother got sick with lung cancer, the hospice nurse sent him out to um, get one of the prescriptions that had run out, he came back, um, never made it to the pharmacy. He had a newspaper and a cup of coffee in his hand from Wawa, just had forgotten entirely what his purpose was in leaving the house. Um, at this point, the individual may start to confabulate, and I'm going to actually make a little note about confabulation because confabulation comes up in, um, I think it's Wernicke's encephalopathy as well. But confabulation is making things up to fill the gaps in memory. I'm just giving you a little time to take a note, too, if you need to. So that's confabulation. Um, and these people aren't deliberately lying. 
but they are embarrassed, they are aware, they are still in intelligent enough to know that this uh, is occurring and that it should not be. Um, and so they'll make up a story. Oh, yeah, I remember we went to Europe and we did this and we did that and maybe it never, ever happened. Um, so that's confabulation. At this point, the individual is starting to become aware that this is a problem they cannot hide forever and that it will probably get worse. They are embarrassed and ashamed and they start to withdraw socially, which actually compounds the problem because a lack of social stimulation um, can actually cause this disorder to progress very rapidly. So that's mild to moderate cognitive decline. And this is when the person can get depressed. Depression, by the way, I just want a little bit of an aside here. I don't want to get too sidetracked. Depression symptoms can mimic neurocognitive disorder. You get the same forgetfulness, the same lack of ability to problem solve. There is um, some cognitive decline with depression. So if a person who has Alzheimer's gets depression, very often they will deteriorate more rapidly. Um, and their, the severity of their Alzheimer's will look worse than um, what it might be without the depression. So that's stage four. Stage five is moderate cognitive decline. And at this point, this is where the um, individual went from being able to function at some level independently to being unable to function independently. They are losing their ADLs. They are forgetting how to comb their hair. They are forgetting to brush their teeth. They are forgetting addresses and phone numbers. They're forgetting um, basic safety things. Now, of course, that doesn't stop them sometimes from getting in a car and driving. Um, at this point, people start to have those behavioral changes because they are frustrated. The world becomes increasingly less uh, available to them in terms of being able to organize it and make sense of it. Um, they're still in there, their personality is still in there, and yet um, nothing makes sense anymore. So that's stage five. Uh, and this is where family members start to need help. Stage six is moderate to severe cognitive decline, and at this point, um, this person might not remember getting married. They might not remember raising their kids. They might not remember the name of their spouse, although they might recognize the face. They get disoriented to, pers to place and time. Um, they have to have help with almost every uh, activity of daily living, and they need to be kept safe because they might have wandering. They might, um, gosh, my husband's grandmother used to try and light her cigarettes on the stove. That's how she lit them for years. And as she got older, um, she would forget to like hold her hair back, and she set her hair on fire a couple times. Um, so safety is a serious, serious issue. Um, at this point, they might become incontinent of urine and stool. Um, they might become aggressive. They get agitated. They perseverate. Perseverating is that repetitive um, sort of getting stuck on something. Um, they get loss of language skills. And at this point, um, you're either looking at having 24-hour care in your home or you're looking at a residential facility. So moderate to severe decline is where um, we see caregivers increasingly unable to cope with the changes that they see in their family member. And stage seven is like the end stage. Um, and this is where the person doesn't recognize their family, um, usually bedridden, they have very little language, um, and at this point there are physical sequelae. If you're bedridden you have increased susceptibility to things like pneumonia, things like um, heart disease, things like decubitus ulcers or bed sores, um, contractures, and at this point they become uh, unable to fight off infection. They can aspirate, um, swallowing is impaired. So there's a lot of things, and this is usually what the death is caused by um, in Alzheimer's. So those are your seven stages of Alzheimer's. Again, don't get like hung up on um, which ones go to what behaviors. Just know that there is a progression, um, and that's kind of what it looks like. So now it's time to talk about um, the nursing process with clients um, who have neurocognitive disorder. And the first part of the nursing process is always this assessment. And as far as your nursing assessment, you're going to gather as much data as possible by talking to your client and by talking to the people who are close to your client, the family members. Um, so you're going to get a thorough history. Um, you're going to talk about when symptoms occurred, um, what types of memory loss. 
differences in behaviors, differences in judgment. Um, so that would be your initial step. And then you might administer the mental status exam. And there are various tools. Um, there's the mental status exam. There's the mini mental status exam. There are functional assessment screening tools, um, global deterioration scale. And we're going to actually do um, an example of the uh, mental status exam on each other in class um, so that you get the experience of what that looks like. And you'll see things like um, drawing the numbers on a clock, which is very interesting. Remember, we talked about normal aging, you don't lose the ability to do things that you do all the time. So handwriting doesn't usually deteriorate unless you have arthritis or other sort of functional um, deficits that don't involve cognition. But if you're drawing a clock and the numbers are sort of every which way because you can't seem to make your brain put the numbers on the right place on the clock, um, then there's an issue that goes beyond normal aging. And so that might be something that we do. They, uh, you might see other dementia scales in use, um, but the mental status exam is a pretty standard tool. Medical diagnosis might be made through MRI imaging. Um, your book has some pretty interesting input on that. Now, you know, that's interesting because that's really fairly recent. Uh, most of the time it was a diagnosis that was assigned based on the mental status exam and symptoms and ruling out other, like, medical causes of dementia, um, vascular dementia, ruling out Parkinson's disease, ruling out other things that could be causing the neurocognitive disorder. Um, but those might be some things that you see. Some further assessments you might want to make um, in your nursing assessment. Um, you want to assess for the emotional and behavioral changes associated with um, neurocognitive disorder. For example, you will see the three most common defense mechanisms, um, denial. Often the patient and the family will deny that there is a problem. Um, sometimes the family caregiver uh, is not ready to admit that their loved one has something that's irreversible and progressive. <clears throat> And so they will sort of make excuses. Um, confabulation, we already talked about. That's making things up to fill in the gaps. And then perseveration. Perseveration is when they sort of get stuck. They're so frustrated um, by things that they kind of hyper-focus on irrelevant details. For example, somebody might get just obsessed with, where's my teeth, where's my teeth, where's my teeth? Um, if you work in long-term care or with the geriatric population, you will see examples of all these behaviors. You also might see um, catastrophic behavior. These are people who have, like, meltdowns, for lack of a better word. Um, their frustration grows, especially when they're overstimulated or stressed, um, and they can get very agitated and um, sometimes aggressive. Um, you want to assess their ability to perform their activities of daily living, and just like we did with the child who had intellectual disability, um, you want to be there and maybe cue them to do what they can for themselves, um, but be prepared to step in and do what needs to be done. Whatever they can't do for themselves, you're going to have to um, supply. And, um, you know, because this is a progressive disorder, you're continually assessing because you never know when they're going to lose the ability to do various things. Um, promoting physiological integrity, you need to assess... Um, what their risks are. Are they a risk for safety? And safety can be at risk because um, people have impaired judgment. They don't know that when they see smoke, they should leave the house. They might, you know, sit down on the floor instead. Um, they have impaired reasoning and problem-solving abilities, and so, um, you know, crossing the street could be a problem. Wandering, very frequently, for whatever reason, when people get to those moderate phases, um, wandering is a big problem, and so that's when we might need bed alarms. But you have to assess this person's risk at all times. They're a risk for falling um, because they're, you know, not aware of their mo uh, limited mobility sometimes. You know, the mobility problem might be just as a result of aging, but the fact that they don't um, know their limitations and they have poor judgment um, makes them a risk for falling. Put that in there. And aspiration, especially in terminal phases of uh, Alzheimer's or dementia, um, you can have impaired swallowing, and really risk for aspiration is one of the biggest um, safety issues that you have with that population. Um, and so when you have a patient who looks like they're at risk for uh, aspiration, you need to um, get that swallowing evaluation. 
Physiologic problems also, very, very common. You're going to look for things like nutrition, hydration, skin integrity. Sleep disturbance is so common, these people start to sundown. Um, so you want to assess for that. Um, do they get more agitated in the evenings um, as the sun's going down? Are they up all night? And then we want to promote sleep and rest, and I'll talk about that more with the interventions. Um, but these folks can get very sort of backwards with their uh, night and day patterns. So these are all things um, that the nurse should assess. So now that we've um, done our nursing assessment, it's time to move on to our interventions. And we can do outcomes um, really when we're evaluating. Um, but all of our interventions for folks who are on the uh, moderate to severe end of Alzheimer's disease or any other neurocognitive disorder should really be geared um, towards maintaining safety and preserving dignity and allowing this person to have whatever care they need. If they can perform some activities of self-care, we allow it. We might have to cue them. We might have to break those activities down into smaller steps and we have to be prepared to assist them with whatever they cannot do themselves. Um, so that's, you know, where our interventions are coming from. And of course, you know, they're gonna, you're gonna pretty much stay close to that base of Maslow's hierarchy with these folks. Um, as they decline, their needs go really lower and lower towards the base of that pyramid. Um, safety is very important in folks who don't have good judgment or who might wander. Um, so we have to maintain close supervision. Now, a room near the nurse's station is ideal, but I worked in long-term care in the beginning of my career, and I can tell you in some facilities there just aren't enough rooms um, to accommodate that near the nurse's station. And also, if the nurse's station is very um, busy and very loud, that might not be the ideal place, particularly on night shift, um, where you have folks who sundown, you certainly don't want a lot of stimulation. Um, we can use monitors and bed alarms um, monitors now, video monitoring is becoming increasingly more common um, to keep an eye on patients who are at risk um, for some of the safety issues that we've talked about, falling, wandering, um, and bed alarms certainly, uh, and chair alarms have use for this population. In terms of um, keeping people sort of oriented to their environment and keeping people uh, from being agitated, it's really, really important to have consistency, um, consistent caregivers, a consistent routine. Um, you want a lot of familiarity. Things need to look the same to them. This is not a population that deals well with transition or novelty. Um, when you're losing parts of your memory and it's seemingly random, it's almost cruel to sort of change that routine up a lot. Um, it might feel like it would make life more interesting, but this is a population that sort of needs um, the same TV shows at the same time. If breakfast is at 8, breakfast is always at 8. If after breakfast we take a shower, you know, you kind of keep that same structured routine. And as much as possible, you do want to keep the same caregivers, people who understand the challenges this person has. They know this patient well. Um, I can tell you that what was really hard for both me and for the residents at one of the nursing homes I worked at, um, I was uh, contracted through an agency. And so I could go to a different facility almost every time I worked, and I might be assigned to a different unit any time that I worked. I just filled in holes. Well, of course, that was always sort of the toughest assignment because I didn't know the residents. I didn't know who was a wanderer, who was at risk for choking. And, you know, when you have 27 residents, um, that can be hard. It was hard on the residents, too, because they didn't know who I was, and they couldn't tell if it was because I was a, truly a stranger or because they just had lost the memory of somebody that they should know. Um, and so consistent caregivers is uh, an important part of your care plan um, as much as, as you can do that within the circumstance and still give your caregivers a break. Um, and, you know, with staff turnover, sometimes that is difficult. Structured routine, again, um, it's very helpful in orienting your patient. Um, in terms of safety, good lighting um, will minimize the falls risk, and it also helps them sort of make sense of their environment. If there's a lot of shadows or lights, even mirrors sometimes can be very disorienting to somebody with a cognitive um, disorder. Um, and frequent orientation to time and place. This is a patient who might think it's Valentine's Day, so you have to tell them, no, it's Saturday, it's June 20th, um, and then you sort of reorient them to what's going on here and now. Um, we're going to play bingo now, and then after that it will be time for dinner. 
and sort of reorient them. Of course, you're going to do this without arguing. If they insist that it's Valentine's Day, there's got to be a point where you just go, okay, um, you know, and you make them a big, bright, red, shiny heart. Um, arguing with a patient is really never appropriate, particularly one that can't reason um, and is losing their memory. We want to lower levels of stimuli. If they are, if this patient is bothered by noise, if they are bothered by a lot of busyness and activity, you might have to gear them towards, you know, a lower level of stimulation. Um, it's not unlike your patient who is in the psychiatric facility who starts to get agitated and you see that pacing or that, you know, that, that escalation. Um, you want to sort of reach this before it triggers a catastrophic reaction. Um, where they just can't cope at all and trigger get them into something quieter it's really it's the level of stimulation that a lot of times will trigger this agitation and of course like I said we're at the bottom of the pyramid nutrition hygiene rest other basic needs toileting if this patient um, is still able to be toileted you're going to remember to toilet them frequently incontinence is not uncommon um, incontinence is one of the biggest reasons that people put their loved ones in nursing homes. It can also be a trigger for abuse. Sometimes people just cope poorly with um, having to attend to that basic need. Um, and so part of our jobs as nurses is to keep this patient um, clean and preserve their dignity as much as possible. And so we're going to attend to those needs. Um, memory aids, very important. You know, we used to have a schedule for my dad for the TV. He liked like three shows that he had to watch over and over, but he could never remember what channel they were on. And if you did something um, as stupid as, you know, the cable company would change some of the channels around when they went to high def and uh, like Fios, whatever, they changed the numbers of the channels and he just lost it. He couldn't remember when, how to find Two and a Half Men, so we would put up little charts for him. Um, two and a Half Men comes on at 4.30, it's channel 57, and that was, you know, sort of what kept him together. You want to communicate with people who have NCD in short, simple sentences. You want to talk about familiar things. Don't try to bring in new, oh, this is what's going on in the news. You might want to, um, you know, put on channels that play shows that they've seen a hundred times. My dad would watch The Outlaw Josie Wales with Clint Eastwood, I mean, twice a night, every night for the last, like, six months, um, you know, and you would think, how can you possibly watch this one more time, but that was the sort of thing that kept him anchored um, and kept him calm. Um, reorient, reorient the person gently, like I said, you don't argue, you try and present reality, but you don't push it. It's not like with your schizophrenic patient who is seeing something horribly frightening um, that isn't really there. This is a person who just, you know, they, they are just confused. Um, so if they're happier when they're confused, you know, if they're calling you by their daughter's name and it doesn't seem to upset them, don't let it upset you. Reminiscence therapy is very um, helpful to people. Sometimes long-term memory is still intact when short-term memory is gone. And so getting out photo albums until they get to that point where they can't remember the significant events in their own lives. If you keep reminding them of the happier times in their lives, a lot of times these people um, are calmer and um, you know they deteriorate a lot less rapidly. You see less depression. Any activity that they need um, to do, you want to break into smaller steps and you want to cue these folks. Um, you know, if getting dressed and brushing hair and brushing teeth and taking a shower is too much all at once, you start with one thing and then you know you move on to the next thing, but it's little baby steps and you're there and you're cueing them as they need it. Do not let this person have unlimited decision-making capacity. Limit your choices, limit decision-making. It leads to frustration. Um, with all of your other cognitive abilities, the ability to make a decision is compromised with neurocognitive disorder, and so um, you want to you want to allow patients some choice, but it should be you know do you want chicken or fish, not what do you want for dinner. Um, it's a choice of two things: do you want the brown shoes or do you want the white shoes? And then if they get confused, you can make a choice for them. Um, encourage the family to visit as much as possible. It's important for the patient. It's important for the family. Um, the family does need a break sometimes, and be mindful of that. Um, respite care is sometimes the, one of the kindest things you can do. Um, support the caregivers. It's very, very important. Okay, so that's really our intervention. 
So even though we're talking about the nursing process for clients with neurocognitive disorder, I'd like to talk a little bit about the medications that are used for NCD because it is an intervention. Um, first, we have cholinesterase inhibitors, and cholinesterase inhibitors work on an enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is necessary for functioning of the neurons, so if there's not enough of it, the neurons can die. Um, and so these medications are very useful for mild to moderate. Unfortunately, a lot of people don't come for treatment until their uh, disease is a little more advanced. However, if you can get them into treatment when their disease is still in its early uh, stages, you can prescribe um, some of these medications. And the prototype of this could be your Aricept or Dinepazil if you're making a template. Um, there are other medications I can tell you from personal experience that a lot of people anecdotally do not feel that these work. However, there is a modest increase in cognitive functioning um, with the use of these medications. They really only delay the inevitable, um, just so you're aware. Aricept in higher doses has been approved for more moderate uh, to severe manifestations of neurocognitive disorder. Uh, however, <clears throat> it's mostly used for the earlier stages. Next, we have the NMDA receptor antagonist called memantine, or Namenda. Um, and this one works by decreasing the levels of glutamate in the brain. Um, when there's too much glutamate circulating among the neurotransmitters, you can have irre irreversible brain cell death. Um, and I could draw you a picture or make it a little more technical, it doesn't matter. If, it stops brain cells from dying. It is prescribed for moderate to severe, um, and you do see an improvement in cognitive function and the ability to perform ADLs, but this is not gonna give you back whatever level of functioning you had pre-morbid. Um, so just be aware of that. These drugs are not miracles. Um, there still needs to be a lot more research uh, you know, before we make those kind of strides with Alzheimer's. Antipsychotics are used for aggressive behavior or severe agitation. Um, the folks who get up and wander or um, the ones who take a swing at the nursing staff, um, the ones who can be violent. Um, we use risperidone, olanzapine, zyproxaquatiapine. These should be very, very familiar medications to you at this point because you've seen them in schizophrenia and you've seen them in bipolar and you've seen them in autism spectrum disorders, and you uh, may have even seen them in depression with psychotic features. Basically, they have uses in a lot of different disorders. Um, risperidone is probably the biggest one. Of course, with um, elderly adults, you have to worry about over-medication and over-sedation. Um, it can affect balance. You can get a lot of drooling with risperidone. That's uh, one of the side effects that you know you're over-medicating when you have to keep a stack of um, handkerchiefs by the person's bedside um, because the drooling is so uh, heavy. Um, you know, again, watch for your extrapyramidal symptoms, particularly with certain different types of dementia like Lewy body, um, but they are in use for patients who um, are unmanageable without them. Now we have a, a couple of different psychotropic medications that are just used for symptoms. We have the SSRIs. Um, now you have to watch with SSRIs. Some of them have such long half-lives they're not really appropriate for elderly patients, but Zoloft and Paxil do seem to be um, good for depression and anxiety for patients who um, have those comor comorbid conditions with their neurocognitive disorder. Benzodiazepines can be used for anxiety and agitation However, with caution only, um, Ativan is the most common of them. They should not be used as a chemical restraint, um, if at all possible. They do increase confusion, they increase falls risk, and they um, can overly sedate your patient. Um, and so you try not to get in the habit of them. Of course, there are some patients who just can't be managed um, without them. And so you give them, but you give uh, mostly Ativan because of the, its um, longer half-life. Um, and it's, you know, ability to sort of, uh, it, it's better for elderly people. Sedative hypnotics, we do not use barbiturates in the elderly um, with Alzheimer's. What we can use are Ambien, Sonata, Lunesta, you know, some of the newer anti, um, or some of the newer, yeah, anti-insomnia medications. Um, you have to watch uh, wandering with these folks. You have to watch balance. You have to watch falls risk. Um, and you really don't want to get in the habit of relying on sedative hypnotic medications for sleep. Um, 
these are the folks who can sundown. Now, I can tell you from working in long-term care, some of the most frustrating uh, night shifts that I had to work were when we worked with a day staff that let patients sleep all day, and then they would be up all night, and they would be wandering, and they would be walking into other patients' rooms who needed to sleep. Um, so you want to promote good sleep hygiene. You want to keep them awake and more or less active during the day, involved in those structured activities um, according to their routine. You want to have them do some mild exercise, whatever's within their capacity. Um, exercise is great as long as it's not real close to bedtime. At helping people get into a good sleep routine, sleep hygiene, having a sleep ritual, not having tea or coffee right before bed, um, instead of relying on the sedative hypnotics because the side effects can be very bad. Um, and you don't want to have people who are drowsy and hungover during the daytime. It's going to um, interrupt their routines. So those are some of the medications that are commonly in use for people with um, neurocognitive disorder. And we're talking about evaluating um, our goals and our outcomes. Um, if the patient remains safe, you've met your goal. If the patient can communicate her needs, the patient can assist in their self-care. These are just some goals. And of course, you're going to evaluate all your interventions based on whether or not your patient meets their goals. Um, it might not be realistic for a patient to maintain reality orientation all the time. To the best of her abilities, maybe not the most specific goal, but it does describe uh, what you're going for. And so you would evaluate that periodically and make sure that your interventions are appropriately geared to those things.